It's Thursday, April 23rd, 2015. This is Tech Talk Today, episode 162. My name is Chris. My name is Alan. Hey, Alan. Good morning. Nice to have you in studio. How was your trip out here? Uh, Not bad. Yeah, and how has your stay been in the hotel and all that good stuff? Yeah, the hotel is very nice. Thank you, you for the recommendation. You know you know what we haven't done yet? And this is probably, we should write this wrong. We haven't gone to your favorite teriyaki place yet. It's beside the hotel. Oh, really? I noticed that last night when we got <laughs> it. I'm like, I'm definitely going there. And <laughs> oh, I don't care if any of you guys are coming or not, but I'm getting my teriyaki. I like, I like it. You get here now, you got your own independence now that you get your favorite teriyaki joint. Yes. Uh, well, very good. So uh, we've got a lot to cover today. Some stories we've been speculating on this show for a while broke yesterday after we got off the air. So before we tear into all of it, let's bring in our mumble room. Time appropriate greetings, mumble room. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. So uh, it's here. It's uh, it's proud, and it is going to be big. It is Google Fi, Project Fi. It's Google's official wireless service. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. There, it's, so is this only available to Nexus Six to start? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, it seems like yeah. It. Yeah, yeah. Because I have one, although it seems to be only. Yeah, uh, essentially, uh, I put I put the whole skinny uh, right there in the in the in the uh, in the in the summary. I think at some point, but it's essentially it is true. It's legitimate. It's Google's new wireless service, and uh, it's available right now at kind of an interesting price structure. It costs twenty dollars a month, plus uh, uh, I think it's uh, ten dollars for every gigabyte. Yep. Uh, and it's going to be in the U.S. and abroad. Available for Nexus Six. It runs over the Sprint and T-Mobile networks. Uh, do you want to see Google's video on it? Uh, yeah, let's just watch a little bit. It's, sure. it, these things are always, you know, I, you know what? Here, we'll just watch a minute of it because it's human right. It's the thing that enables you to do all the great things right. that you want to do in your life. Because we'll just play a second because I love this when they start bold, right? So think about this too. When I watch this, this is that's why I want to play this. When I watch this, I started thinking they probably just pissed off their most important partners, the carry, the wireless carriers, right? That's who's buying Android. Well, it's not the carriers that do it though. It's like Samsung that manufactures it, right? But then who buys it from Samsung? I suppose, but, yeah. But they're they're kind of forced to do whatever they want, or would right. buy the, to to sell the phones that people want to buy. They're kind of stuck, aren't they? But then again, if people only have the choice of certain phones, they will learn to live with it. So yeah. maybe it's just, it, you know it's it's, I feel it's like it's a new market. Free mar- yeah, but it's an interesting about a free market is that it's not necessarily that free, right? The the vendors have some control. You know, the phone companies because there are only a couple of them yeah. could really decide that yeah. Android isn't the thing anymore. Yeah, and and try to kill it. All right, so let, well, let's watch this and see if that's what's gonna if they're going after the carriers. <coughs> Connection is a human right. It's the thing that enables you to do all the great things that you want to do in your life. Our mobile phones and and the connectivity in those phones are the thing that keep us not just connected to networks, but connected to people. With Project Fi, we wanted to build a wireless experience really from the ground up. As you move around the world, there are different networks that are strong in different places. In your home, the Wi-Fi might be strongest. On your commute, a cellular network might be strongest. And the cellular network near your office might be the cellular network in your home. What Project Fi does is very seamlessly move people between networks depending on where they are. That's interesting. They can really help you transform the way you communicate and give you the best connectivity you need wherever you are. So let's stop right there. Uh, so it, it, it switches between Sprint and T-Mobile and Wi-Fi sort of seamlessly, mm-hmm. uh, which is pretty interesting. Uh, is you don't really have to manage that very much. Uh, I, I like that about it. Project Fi, to me, <clears throat> what, what's starting to feel a little weird about it is sort of, it feels like it should be called Project Hug Fi. Like it's the, it's, it's the hug wireless network. Like everybody just loves everybody. When it's, but it's, re- it's really about data tracking. It's really about, it's really about getting more people on Google services. It's not about... It's right. not about uh, pushing the boundaries of communication for humanity. Well, I, I think what it's going to be about, I, the, obviously they haven't done it yet, uh, but I think their their end goal is going to be, you know, data is $10 a gigabyte, but data to Google is free. Yeah, that would be very interesting to see how that plays now, out. Now, uh, at this point, they probably can't do that because they're doing MVNO off of right. those carriers. And those but, carriers are going to charge them a, a fixed yeah. rate that Google has to be able to you right. know, pay for. And... and the, <clears throat> I don't know. Is ten dollars a gigabyte a, a good price compared well, to other places? So good question. So uh, Ars Technica has done a hell of a write up. Uh, who wrote this over at Ars Technica? This is Ron Amandio uh, wrote this incredible write up and got when got the visuals from all the different web uh, vendors and like and and speaking before we go too much further. Here's Ting. Ting's on this lineup now. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you something I've noticed. Ting is now a part of the conversation. Yeah. 
This has actually so far been a really good thing for Ting because now people are talking about Ting. And when you look at the comments, people are like, yeah, Ting did this two years ago. And what does our IRC say when we start talking about Google uh, Fi, yep. Project Fi? Like, yeah, that almost, like it almost sounds well, as Well, they're reselling the same networks right. that, that right. Ting is. And, but here's the difference between the, uh, here's, I think, that like the long term fundamental difference between Ting and Project Fi. Ting is, it's based on your account. And you can have a pooled set of time and minutes between all of your devices, tablets, phones, uh, a tiny little smartphone, um, you know, things that are like a, a, a GSM chip in, a, in like a tiny little portable device, all from one shared pool, where this Google Project Fi is device-based. Exactly. You yeah. pay per device again. And, and, and I don't like that, that model as much. That, that's something that kind of surprises me because I was under the impression Google kind of wanted you to have a Google phone and a Google tablet. And, yeah, and a Google Watch with a, C, with a GSM chip yeah. in it, and you'd think, but yeah. So anyways, Ars Technica has this great write-up. So Sorry, the watch? has its own connection? I well, that the watch is just slave Only one of them, the, okay. one of the Samsungs, but you know, the next couple of generations, they're absolutely going to put that in there. As I, I, I wasn't sure down. if they would do that or just make it slave off the phone via Bluetooth. Well, maybe. Uh, that's what most of them do, but Samsung's gear, one of the gear line does have a has an LTE chip in it. So oh, look at this, I can see Alan. The advantage of that. You can see, like, it depends on how you use it. Um, so for me, because I'm pretty savvy with Wi-Fi, Ting is clearly, clearly, clearly far and above the cheapest. But uh, if nothing else, it's, it's fascinating now to see Ting, Sprint, T-Mobile, and Verizon all kind of compared next to each other with this project. Yeah, and, and this graph is, is not necessarily representative of certain people's usage, like... Uh, you know the plans they put together here are, are right. It's, it's well. The first thing is that it's it goes to their best one, three, or five gigabytes. Yeah. Whereas at Ting, you can use and pay for exactly one point seven gigabytes. Yeah, and that's a good point there. And and they're just they just went and did like an average like estimation. Now of course some of these places like Ting they have their own calculator where you could see exactly how much you would save, mm -hmm. uh, or how much it would cost you depending. So so I think for some. Yeah, uh, actually, it, they have a note right here. It says Ting's a la carte pricing makes it very hard to fit in this chart. So we went with just one device. Whereas, you know, right. if, if they'd done a chart of this with two devices, Ting would have been so far right. cheaper than everybody. Right. Yeah, because there'd only be another. Yeah. And five hundred minutes. Uh, most people don't use five hundred minutes. No, not and, not most people you know, that are non uh, non phone users. I mean, a lot of people like exactly. in, in our group are mostly just texters or data well, users. Well, even like I get support calls on my phone and I still don't use yeah. more than like 200 minutes yeah. a month. Yeah. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll continue to follow it and see where it goes. It's in beta right now. And you have to have a Nexus 6 or promise to get a Nexus 6 if you get in the beta, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, here's an interesting story that maybe we could uh, talk about more. On, I guess uh, the one thing they don't cover, they keep saying, what? you know, uh, in the US and abroad, but they don't mention what mobile networks it was going to use yeah. abroad. Yeah. I guess they, it's just actually going to roam on. Or perhaps they're still in development. Because, uh, you know, I have a Nexus 6, and I would love to have uh, uh, not TELUS. Yeah, yeah uh, for sure. Basically, uh, when I roam to the U.S., I would like to not pay $5 a megabyte. Ooh. <laughs> you know, $10 wow. a gigabyte sounds pretty good when now, I pay $5 a megabyte. Now, are those gold-wrapped 24-karat megabytes, Alan? Well, I, I, I bought a, a U.S. travel pass, so I get a cheaper rate for the next 30 days mm. on, on U.S. data. So it's just silver-wrapped gold. Yeah. Uh, or silver-wrapped data. All right, yeah. look at this one, now. This is almost, this is like we're going to do a, a faux tech snap right here. Security companies are being accused of exaggerating Iran's cyber threat against the U.S. A widely well, yeah. read report <laughs> accusing Iran of hundreds of thousands of cyber attacks against the U.S. has been criticized as hugely inaccurate as well as motivated by marketing and politics. According to a new white paper and critics around the security industry, the original report solicited by a conservative think tank and published by Norse in the lead up to the RSA security conference hit the front page of the New York Times by calling the handshakes and network scans sophisticated cyber attacks. So anyways, and anyways, they're yeah. just so, so somebody reports. running Nmap yeah. is is a sophisticated cyber criminal who's coming to terrorize your network. This is the level of dialogue now. These so networks keep making different claims. It gets confusing. What? The fastest, the what? strongest, the most in your face. You like unpause the Google video. I think. Yeah. No, I think that's on your site. There, it's funny. Is, huh. is there a tab playing audio over there, Alan? <laughs> what is that? That's great. It almost sounds like it's related to our stuff. That's I brilliant. have no idea. Do, uh, all right. These sites playing, sites playing I like it. Side. We have a ghost in the machine. Hey, Alan. Was that coming from me? Yeah, I think so, because it's on your channel. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, so check this one out. Sorry. So along the same line, uh, you're going to love you this. You should have installed Adblock or something. You're going to love this because you can just sit back and judge us. Okay. Although I don't know if you have anything like this. So just in the, in, the, in the shadow of that story where we're over-exaggerating cyber threats, the House on Wednesday passed the first major cybersecurity bill uh, since the attack on Sony Entertainment. This is in the shadow of the Sony Entertainment hack. It's... Uh, yeah. Which turned out to be how big of a deal? Oh, this none? is PCNA, Protecting Cyber Networks, backed by the House Intelligence Committee, and it will strengthen our digital defenses. And what that really means is it enables companies to share information with the government and be indemnified for revealing right. anything. 
So what you should really do is watch TechStep today when we talk about the French version of this law, which is slightly worse. Really? And, and what the backlash is to it. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that will be. So that will uh, be a good time. Like, like, really, I, I wish this hadn't passed already so that we right. could point to the French example well, and be I like, mean, it's only if gone you through do the house. this, we will do the same damn thing. It's only gone through the house yet, so okay. maybe it's still maybe there's still time to raise a stink about it. Uh, so, well, yeah. this one this one allows companies to to cooperate. The French one required them to cooperate and not say anything about it. Mm. Interesting. Hmm. Well, we'll keep tracking that too. Hey, I thought this story the, the, was the chat room is funny. Uh, it says Sony hack was an inside job, yeah. which is kind of a play on the on the you know conspiracy theories about 9/11 or whatever. Yeah. But at the same time, the Sony hack was actually an inside <laughs> job. Yes, I know, right? Yeah, it, it's. Uh, <coughs> It, oh, this is a, it, we are living in a weird time. It, I'm I'm glad that we I'm glad that you and I are old enough to live in a time before we got really crazy about computers, so that we, we have the perspective when they weren't these big scary boogeyman things. Uh, all right, Sp- speak, uh, speaking of big scary boogeyman in the future, Apple is begun now. Don't get your pitchforks, everybody, because this happens from time to time. But then they abort, and then they sort of reformat and reinstall new policies into their uh, drones and. They allow these apps in all of a sudden. But Apple appears to be now rejecting apps that include, wait for it, Pebble support. That's right. Now that the Apple Watch is hitting the market, it appears that Apple may be right, rejecting apps so people would have, have an Pebble iPhone support. and a Pebble and want them to work together, and Apple's like, no? I, I, I don't know. I mean, Pebble, Pebble support's been on iOS for a long time. Uh, and so uh, I'm not quite sure what happened here. But so an app was submitted to the App Store called CNAV, or CNAV, CNAV US, I'm sorry, CNAV US, and it had Pebble support to give you nav directions on your watch while you're driving or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's been in there for about two years. It's been in the description for about two years. And then they were rejected when they submitted an update. And here's what they wrote. They said, we've just had our latest version of CNAV US app rejected by the app store by Apple because we support the Pebble smartwatch and say so in the app description and the metadata. Uh, they also talk about it a little bit in the notes. CNAV US has previously been approved by Apple with no problem. We've had Pebble support in CNAV for nearly two years, and there are no changes to our support for the Pebble in this version. Why is Apple doing this? So so d- when Apple rejects an app, do they actually say why, or do they just like, reject it and you have to guess? I, it kind of depends different times, but it appears that in this time they did specifically say it was because of Pebble, the Pebble support. Uh, so here's here's why. Because what they'll do is they'll, they'll quote sections of the uh, policy. So uh, section 3.1, apps or metadata that mention the name of any other mobile platform will be rejected. Rejected. Ah, so they just kind so of don't assume, mention our competitors in right. the app description. But because they mentioned Pebble, and that's the only other competitor, which yeah. wasn't a competitor until Apple launched a watch. I so specifically, if your app declares support for the Pebble smartwatch, you're screwed. But then, how do I know as a consumer if that app has support for my smartwatch? Exactly. That is pretty damn weak. Yeah, that's that's the policy has some in, inherent. So here's the details. Here's the notes. We've noticed that your app or its metadata contains irrelevant platform information in the app. Irrelevant? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah. Provide future platform compatibility plans or other platform references is not appropriate in the App Store. Well, I can understand them saying that uh, rejecting the app because the next version will support the Pebble Watch. Yeah, that's... Or yeah. something. Or the yeah. next version will support the Apple Watch. Yeah. But yeah. But yeah, I... Uh, yeah, that's that's mumble horrible. room. Anybody uh, have the other end of the, this argument? Anybody want to take Apple's defense and play devil's advocate? I guess you could say multi-platform support. Yeah, but that, but then, then it, when support? it doesn't work with my Samsung watch, I'm going to be all downloading mm. that application. So, I guess I guess you'd have to say multi-platform support in the description, and then when you open the app, you'd have to say these smartwatches supported. Yeah. And then you know what I would do is I would because because this but, is the iOS really, if you, app store. If you, if you have if you have a Pebble, you're gonna search the Apple App Store for Pebble yeah, to find absolutely because I just got my a, new Pebble a, a time. Watch. Think but about I guess May. at the end and uh, if Apple's happy, then there will be no results when you search for Pebble. Yeah, but think about in May when the Pebble time ships the new latest Pebble Watch and everybody wants to go find all the apps that support it. Pebble's gonna have to have their own website with it, a list of yes. these, a link to all the yeah. places in the Apple Store where they don't mention they support Pebble, so they could get listed right. in the Apple Store. And and this is it's just once, horrible. And and Apple, the Apple App Store search is already horrible. It's already like yeah. the worst search. So uh, the Android Play one's pretty bad too. Yeah. I was trying to find the my yeah. account app <laughs> for my cell ironic. phone provider, yeah. and it was full of things that were not my cell phone provider. I know, isn't that or, ironic? Or the version of my cell phone provider in South America. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's that's not gonna work. No good. I don't I no don't good. want. You know, yeah. tell us a Mundo. Hey, uh, check this one out. Uh, this is, uh, I think we're all pro- probably uh, uh, Amazon users and uh, shoppers here, that, that uh, or probably the majority of us are. Uh, for those of you in Germany, though, you're going to be able to get Amazon boxes delivered to the trunk of your Audi. 
Amazon customers will be able to order parcels delivered directly to the boot of their car under a pilot scheme launched in Germany with Audi. A group of Audi customers in Munich uh, who use Amazon Prime will be able to have the packages delivered to the trunk of their car. So you're at work, parked in the parking lot, and yeah. the DHL guys can come. Yeah. And then somehow communicate with like the Audi version of OnStar and have them pop the trunk, I guess? I, I'm thinking that's exactly how it works because it has to work with Audi-specific customers that have yeah. selected to join. And, and then the DHL guy can pop your trunk, fill it with packages, and then leave. Do you like this idea? It's kind of interesting. Yeah. Although at my house, I've just uh, I've had the, the side door uh, set up with a combination lock yeah. that I can give the delivery people. Yeah. And then they can leave the parcel on the door, close it, and... I would only. I'd just be worried that maybe like the guy wouldn't close the trunk correctly, or he'd slam it too hard if I have a really nice Audi or something like yeah. that. But it is a fascinating idea. I think. I think it's temporary. It's all about drones. All about. Well, it, this this seems like uh, Audi kind of went or grouped up with somebody and be like, oh, this will, this will get lots of marketing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like people buy an Audi just so they can get their their Amazon packages delivered to their trunk. Mumble room. If any, if uh, they announced this in your local uh, your local town, would you uh, sign up for it? I'd like to see it come out for other cars. Yeah, yeah. Assuming it came out for your car in your town, would you do well, it? Well, first of all, I, you'd have it's to have an expensive scary. enough car that it has an OnStar type service yeah. where they can remotely unlock yeah. the trunk. I mean, there's going to be a couple of I worry of about any car yeah. that has a service where right. some random person can remotely right. unlock my trunk. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It seems like there could be more. The more you think about it, there could be more problems. But uh, I, I would probably try it. If I yeah. was in a pinch for something, I would well, probably I, try it. Uh, for me, I'm... I'm usually at home, so yeah. a regular delivery works pretty well. Yeah. And uh, although, yeah, DHL is, is the most complicated one for me if I do miss it. Oh, really? Compared to, well, yeah. like Pure Later or UPS, it, it goes to a, a storefront mm -hmm. a couple mm -hmm. of minutes away and I can go pick it up. Yeah. Uh, in FedEx, it goes the next town over, which is a little annoying. Yeah. But DHL, I have no idea what the hell happens. <laughs> it's gone. I think, I think it goes back to the airport or something. Black hole. <laughs> uh, hey, Alan, you know my shame. Uh, and, and that shame is called Google Docs. And you know that I... Hey, I just use Google Docs to write a book. How, how was that frustrating? No. Was, it, was it better no. than doing show notes? Uh, no, it worked very well. I find it very frustrating to do show notes. Um, the, the commenting and suggestion features yeah. worked very well. I could see how it could actually almost work better in a book. See, part of the problem is because some of the formatting it does is almost good for standard writing, but for what we need... Well, we uh, the only thing that it's ever done for Tonos for me was when you press plus sign space and it tries to that. tab it in. It tries that. to auto-tab it for you. Yeah, I hate that. Which I can understand why you would normally want to do that, but yeah, it's yeah. like... So... Putting it in markdown mode would be great, where it yes, actually rendered the markdown or something. Yes, That'd be cool. Yes. Uh, I also would love it to be able to be available on a file system as text. Yeah. So I could search it and stuff easier just from like the command yeah. line or something. Well, uh, guess what? Dropbox is launching a collaborative note-taking service called Dropbox Notes. It's heading into beta right now. Uh, it was spotted earlier this month as Project Composer. It appears to have roots in the company's 2014 acquisition of the collaborative doc startup Hackpad, which we talked about back when it was uh, purchased by Dropbox. Uh, so now it's called Dropbox Notes, uh, Dropbox Notes, and there is a link in the show notes if you'd like to sign up for the beta, uh, or just go to dropbox.com slash notes to sign up. Yeah, uh, mostly by calling it a notes app instead of like a document editing app, they can get away with missing a lot of formatting right. features and, right. and fancy stuff. Yeah, but in the end, you know, for our show notes, that's that would actually be kind of a good thing. Yes and no, but yeah, I kind of like having just plain text. I just want synced yes. plain text. Exactly. Uh, uh, and I like if this is if well, they're they're synced and then there's real time collaborative editing. Yeah, and the only yeah. way to get real time, I think, is if you're going to do it in a web browser. Yeah. Uh, but having the end result end up in a Available as a text file. That is nice. Great. Yeah. So Especially yeah, for what, what we want is 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 cloud mark. Yeah. Which is mark down in the cloud. And I know there's a few out there. Like uh, I know every time I talk about this online, people always say, "Have you uh, checked out uh, Stack Edit and things like that?" And yes, I have. Right. But, uh, and yes, my Oklahoma biggest concern with any of those any okay. other service like that is that we're gonna put a hundred episodes worth of show notes in it, and it's gonna go away. <laughs> Yep. Uh, so what I really like is an open source app we can self-host and back yes. up. Yes. Well, uh, and I, I know there's a few out there. I'd love to hear if anybody has experience with any of them. I know like Etherpad is one. Yeah. It works okay. We've used that at, at, at FreeBSD events a couple times. The problem was we were using, I think, Open Etherpad, which was a hosted one, mm -hmm. and it went away. Mm. And so a bunch of our notes that we didn't get around to copying and pasting into our wiki were just gone. Yeah. Uh, a, but yeah, one with native sad. support for Markdown. And right. 
basically a, a plain text view where you edit, you write Markdown, and then a Markdown view where you actually see the render mm -hmm. would be great. Uh, now, but for the book, we definitely like Google Docs uh, because I could make a suggested edit. So I switch instead of an edit mode, I just sit and cool. basically show what was there and then cross right. it out and make like, yeah. like the uh, tr like uh, revision tracking, right, change tracking in Word, Word docs. Yeah. Uh, except for you would have yeah. the comment about yep. what it was and right. then a little uh, check mark or X and the other person would decide whether they like your text better or not. In. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And then also commenting and, and a couple other things. Yeah. Stuff we'd never actually use in show note mode. Right, exactly. Yeah. But for writing a book, it was, and also for having people review the book, it was yeah. pretty good. Huh. Although, oh, yeah, for uh, sure. For the actual review, we generated a PDF and sent it out for a couple of reasons, uh, partly because we didn't want to force all of our reviewers to have to... Uh, Google accounts. To have Google accounts. And it's well. probably easier to read, really. Yes and no. Having the comments in line is quite helpful. Because, oh, you yeah, know, yeah. when people are... You could have them like, add their comments you know, in line. On page 136, yeah. uh, about halfway down, there it says this, and maybe you meant this. Right. It is way handy if you could have them mark it in there. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I've done that for uh, FreeBSD journal articles, which are about 3,000 words. Although this book is like 45,000 words. <laughs> Jeez, Dylan. Jeez. Wow. Yeah. It kind of sounds like Git, they uh, say. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, well, yes, except for... Git would have problems if you were both editing in real time constantly, mm -hmm. uh, and and you wanted to have all the merging done in a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, in the long term, Git seems fairly reasonable, uh, and we've talked about doing that for actually like publishing the show notes. Yeah, uh, yeah we have. and and using a Markdown engine. Yep. Yep. And I actually did a, a kind of a prototype of it, and then we kind of. Yeah. Well, then we got focused. And on then it was Christmas things. time, and, and everything Linux was fest. busy. And gosh, Linux fest, dude, I am exhausted. So uh, we should probably mention. We haven't started yet. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Linux fest Northwest. I know. I know. Uh, Linux fest Northwest is this weekend, um, and uh, you know it's one of those things where it's kind of coming together at the last minute because uh, Chase had some family stuff come up, right. and he was going to be doing all of the streaming and switching. Ah, yes. So we are working that out, but I think. It's going to be a great show, and I'm excited for Friday night. We're going to have dinner. Saturday night is the after party. Sunday, we'll have a live Linux action show, and we'll be streaming Saturday and Sunday, jblive.tv. Yeah, now I we, think on the, maybe probably on Saturday, we're going to try to squeeze in a little BSD Now stuff. Yeah, nice. Although, uh, 10 a.m. on Saturday, I'm hosting a ZFS uh, Birds of a Feather session as officially as part of- Is it going to uh, be recorded? I don't think so. Oh, jeez. Although you can you can send uh, one of our minions. Yeah, that's true. One but of Noah's minions with one of Noah's cameras, and we yeah. can record it. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I think we're because of our kind of um, last minute streaming situation. I think we're kind of going to be using all of our local resources for that. But yeah. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, all right. So, uh, Mumble Room, any closing thoughts before we get out of here on any of the topics? I wanted to give you guys a chance to chime in one last time before we before we run for the day. No. I think like they don't have anything to say wait. because they're super excited about the double tech snap today, Alan. Yeah. Are you super excited? Are you pumped? Are you ready? Uh, not really. I'm pumped, but I'm not ready. Yeah. The uh, yeah. the show notes could use a little work. Yeah, and I, I have a couple of stories for the roundup. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I filled out the roundup quite good. Oh, uh, really? Because I, I could find lots of stories. Yeah. It was picking the big ones and then actually yeah. writing the breakdowns yeah, of the big yeah. ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but there's plenty of stuff in the roundup. Uh uh, so I got a feedback email that actually came into BSD now, yeah. but it'd be really good for uh, for TechSnap, so we're going to steal it. And you have, if you're listening to this right now, you have a few more hours. Yes, please send us emails. Probably like too late by the time you get this, but yeah, TechSnap at broadcasting.com. All right, make this show better, won't you? TechTalkToday.reddit.com, maybe a video to end the show with or a Kickstarter of the week or a story, anything like that. We'd love to get it. That's a great place to go. And we'll be back for one oh, more. Uh, Kickstarter of the week then. Um, you have one? Yep. The Orion... Something. One what? Here. What are you talking about, Orion? Something. You have one? Uh, well, I've I've joined the Kickstarter. Yes. All right. Well, you search for it. I'll plug our Patreon. If you'd like to, support, we haven't moved up at all this week, and if you'd love to support uh, the the network and all of our efforts that we are underway right now. And man, oh boy, oh boy, can we use your support? Because things are tight right now. Patreon.com/slash today. That's where you go to support the network and uh, get access to the activity feed and all kinds of goodies. And not only that, but we do this show as a thank you to our patrons over there. 475 of you are doing it, and uh, we'd love to have more. Patreon.com slash today. Yes. Did you find the, it? Uh, sorry, the Onion Omega. The Onion Omega. What, it, the, uh, what is it, Alan? It's a uh, think like a Raspberry Pi, but much, much smaller. Ooh, I think you talked about it, Chris. Did I? Oh, boy. Oh, possibly. I'm uh, tired. But it'll run uh, Linux and FreeBSD out of the box. It has a uh, bunch of different expansion modules that uh, will add things like Ethernet ports and Wi-Fi. 
Uh, but oh, I also, did talk uh, about this. Yes, I did talk about this. That's right. Okay. That is the I thing. I just dumped cool. my back in to get two of them. Did we talk about it on Tech Talk, or we t- we talked about this on Linux Unplugged, didn't we? Yeah, it's got a 400 megahertz processor, 64 megabytes of RAM, 16 gigabytes of flash storage, 802.11 BGN, and it has a 18 uh, pin GPIO port, which is pretty badass. Uh, but the biggest thing is that you can use it for Internet of Things type of things, building whatever. But you can write the code for it in Python, Node.js, or PHP uh-huh. instead of writing in C for like a normal. And what's badass is the expansion, uh, the things that go in those GPIO pins, they're stackable. So mm-hmm. like here's a, pic- a picture where they have the Ethernet expansion, and then they stacked on top of that a relay expansion, which is pretty sweet. Uh, so you could see how you could do and like there's a, like a camera expansion. Well, what and, I was uh, thinking is Ethernet a gyroscope OLED expansion too. Yeah, so you can have a little you know message thing without having to do too much hacking to it. Yep. I was thinking that what you do is you get uh, the Ethernet extension and a GSM a GSM sim reader, and you make yourself a little mobile hotspot with the Ethernet. That'd be that sweet. Could work. Uh, if you scroll down, they also have some example things. Oh, they I built. backed it too. Oh, okay. I've been back here twenty five bucks. Nice. I, yeah. I did a little bit more, so I got a bunch of expansions with it. Nice, me. buddy. Uh, yeah, look, there's but if you look at the bottom, they have a bunch of example things they built with it. There's like a ping pong shooting thing, uh, a robot arm, a spy camera, an LED matrix for displaying. Yeah, that's right, and they're going to do apps that you can deploy to it, too. Yep, and a tweet printer. So the little printer hooked up, and it just prints out your tweets yeah. on like a, a receipt roll from like a yeah. cash register. This is unquestionably the Kickstarter of the week. I already backed it. Um, yep. And it's really, really cool. And... Uh, uh, you're, they're going to be able to do. They're gonna, you're going to be able to do 100 megabit Ethernet with it. You'll be able to deploy things like a MIDI player, or this alarm, or uh, it has a, a relay thing, so you can use it to turn things on and off. <laughs> so you know you could build you a garage door opener Linux? or whatever. Uh, uh, well, For because now. of the hardware they picked, yeah. it will run FreeBSD out of the box without FreeBSD having Ooh. to add any work. Nice. Uh, nice. Because all of the individual pieces they they use for it are already supported. Uh, maybe it was on last. I don't remember, but uh, we'll we'll toss a link to it in the show notes because uh, that is a pretty pretty cool Kickstarter, and uh, it's one that both Alan and I backed, and I think a few people in the Mumbrew might have backed it as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, so I got an idea of something we could put free BSD on. Oh, what's that? Yeah, it's our uh, it's our ending video clip. Uh, it's it's a premier hardware platform that's going to change everything, and uh, I, I might as well put free BSD on it. We'll uh, we'll leave you with this, everybody. Thanks for joining us. See you back here tomorrow. It wasn't humanly possible. But now you can have all the power and excitement of Nintendo right in the palm of your hand. Introducing Game Boy. It's portable, it's in stereo, and its games are interchangeable. Plus, Game Boy comes with the outrageous new game, Tetris. And for head-to-head competition, use the revolutionary video link and blow your opponent away. Game Boy, only from Nintendo. Now you're playing with power, portable power.